Good afternoon, everyone. This is Philip Gunn. I am the speaker in Mississippi, and I'm very privileged this afternoon to be hosting this panel discussion on executive overreach. Uh, this is something that's been a hot topic over the last uh, many months, I guess, ever since this pandemic started. And I've been able to talk to a lot of Senate leaders and, and House leaders around the country, legislative leaders around the country about how they're handling the, the pandemic. And one of the topics that continues to arise is exactly what is the role of the legislature and the role of the governor and uh, what um, degree does the governor have to, or what, what authority does the governor have to implement some of the things they're doing. And so we've had a lot of discussions about this and we felt like it was a very relevant topic for the day. And I'm very privileged this afternoon to be joined by some of the top leaders around the country we have with us uh, today uh, Speaker of the House Stephen Hoggard from um, in South Dakota, Speaker Robin Voss of Wisconsin. We have Senate President uh, Karen Fan from Arizona and Senate President Stuart Adams from Utah. The Speaker of North Carolina, Tim Moore, uh, is scheduled to join us and he may in fact join us uh, in a little while. He's on a, a trip with his boys right now. He said he would try to join if he could. I pr certainly appreciate everyone joining this, this discussion via Zoom. Uh, obviously, all of us have had to be uh, flexible. We've had to adjust. We've had to call some audibles on some things that we're doing. And I appreciate each of these individuals taking their time today to, to appear on this panel. Uh, not only are they strong, dynamic, outstanding leaders in their respective state, but they're also good friends of mine. I count each one of them to be a dear friend, and I'm very privileged that they would uh, agree to attend this panel today. So I'm going to kind of lead the panel. I'm going to allow them to, to answer uh, as they see fit. And uh, we've got about five or six questions. I don't know if we'll get to all of them during the time period that we have. We've got about 45 minutes to, to go through this. But uh, we're at least going to have a discussion about uh, executive overreach. What can we each do as legislators and legislative leaders? And what is the appropriate balance that we have to strike between to doing our jobs and uh, addressing the pandemic. So with that kind of introduction, I'm gonna jump right in. Um, I would like, I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to just uh, introduce themselves and then describe for us the, the extent of the COVID outbreak in your state. Would you describe your state as a hot spot? Would you say that the outbreak has, has had less of an impact on your state? Um, as compared to others. So we'll start with uh, Karen Fan from Arizona and I'll let her go first. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, Arizona uh, is in the news a lot right now uh, for many reasons. And one of those is, is that we have gone through a recent spiking again. We were fortunate in the very beginning, we kept our numbers low. Uh, and the reason being is because it just hadn't hit here. You notice things that were going on in Washington, San Francisco, uh, New York City, uh, the big international hubs, if you will, they were the ones that were getting hit the worst because it came on so quickly, nobody could prepare for it. So here in Arizona, we were very fortunate to be able to have a little more time to prepare. We went into a shutdown area, stay at home, not mandatory, but a requested one for about six weeks, which gave us a little more time to prepare for it. And then we opened back up um, about six weeks ago, and we are seeing another spike again because mostly it's now in the young people. It used to be it was the older uh, older folks that were getting the most of the cases. Now it's that 20 to say 40 year old age range because they are going out tubing in the bars and things like that. So it is now this week is starting to flatten off a little bit. So we are seeing light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. Uh President Fan, Let's go now to uh, Speaker Hoggard at uh, South Dakota. Yep. Thank you very much, Speaker Gunn. I appreciate the opportunity to be on the panel. And I will mention that, uh, you know, our state's gotten a lot of credit for being kind of hands off, but that wasn't exactly accurate information. Uh, we were a hot spot at one point with our Smithfield pork processing plant that uh, had a lot of uh, positive tests and and now as time goes by, it seems like the, the goal initially was just to flatten the curve to make sure we didn't overrun our hospitals. And that simply has never been even close to happening. What has happened is we've seen a spike in crime. We've seen a spike in drug abuse and alcohol abuse and pornography consumption. So there's all those 
unexpected or unintended consequences that are really having a devastating effect on, on the whole state. Our revenues, surprisingly, have been uh, pretty consistent with projections from before the pandemic. And so just this past several days, we got some numbers in that indicated we were only $4.5 million away from our projected uh, revenues. So just about no impact at all there. But uh, one of the most striking things I think across the country is the fact that the data seems to me to be highly unreliable. And uh, you, you see the increasing numbers based on increasing tests. And I'm not sure what we're, that we're seeing uh, accurate information out of some states. It seems like they uh, might be driven by the federal dollars that follow those uh, reports. So, you know, that's my general observations. We'll get more into the discussions about executive overreach. But we, too, even though we got credit for being kind of hands off, that wasn't the fact on paper. It really, uh, there was plenty of executive overreach from my perspective. Okay, great. We'll we'll get to that next. Uh, we'll go to, to President Adams in Utah. Thank you. Uh, again, it's great to be with you on Zoom, a little different format. Uh, Utah's had some increases in cases also. And as we've seen those increases, we've tried to determine where they're coming from. And we focused on fatalities. And we when we looked at fatalities, we found that not unlike everywhere else in the nation, about 40 to 50% of those fatalities have come out of long-term care facilities. We also found out that uh, about 90 to 95% of them had comorbidities, meaning they had some other type of uh, health issue, whether it's diabetes or heart disease. And so uh, the medically frail became a, a real issue. We, we also looked to see what was going on with, with uh, the rest of the, 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 the I suppose, life. And one of the things we did is we actually looked at our, our increased deaths. We had May and June, excuse me, April and May, uh, year over year fatalities. We found 164 additional fatalities from 2019 to 2020. And we only had 50 COVID deaths. And we noticed that the acuity level coming into the hospitals was greater because people weren't getting preventative care. They were scared into their bedrooms. And so some of the fatality rates we saw with COVID, some of the were uh, actually had a, a, a different effect on those that didn't have a COVID because we were having people actually pass away at home. And so we looked at it more in a holistic approach. So as we move forward, we're, we're trying to take care of people's health, watch out and, and do what we can to slow the spread. But we're trying to encourage people to go get preventative medical care and then try to balance out our economy. And our economy's done okay, but, but again, it's been a very difficult time and, and uh, we're not immune from the challenges that everyone's had around the country. Okay, thank you, President Adams. We'll go next to uh, Speaker Voss out of Wisconsin. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker Dunn, and thank you to all the folks who are watching across the country. Uh, you know, this whole COVID situation is so challenging for everybody who's in elected office as well as for the public. In the state of Wisconsin, we've taken a slightly different tact. Um, of course, you know, we had a Supreme Court case that was decided, which really uh, put an end to many of the executive powers that our governor uh, had chosen to exercise, really without consulting the legislature. So uh, in Minnesota, the state right next to us, even though they're roughly the same size, uh, they have had almost twice as many deaths as the state of Wisconsin. Uh, and they are still in a somewhat of a lockdown. So I would say we are like many states around the country. We still see a continued increase in the number of cases. But the good news is uh, that we basically are at a similar, similar level of hospitalizations. And while every single death is tragic, um, we've been able to minimize uh, the number of deaths that are occurring because of our excellent healthcare facilities. So uh, I think everybody across the country is concerned about any increase in the number of cases. The thing that we're really trying to focus on is looking at the total number of hospitalizations and the unfortunate deaths that occur uh, from the virus. And in many ways, I think many states around the country have been able to do a really good job at using the great healthcare system that we have. And that's why uh, I think we're in an okay spot vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the country. Uh, we do not consider ourselves this huge hot spot. Uh, the vast majority of what we've done, I think, is, uh, has really worked, and we've been seeing the fruits of that labor. 
Okay, thank you, Speaker. Uh, what about Speaker Moore? Has he been able to join us yet? Do we know? Okay, I don't, I don't hear any response. But um, if he, if he should join us, y'all let me know that he, he's on the line. Let's get to the the next question. I'm gonna let Speaker Hoggard uh, out of South Dakota uh, go first. I know Speaker Voss and Speaker Hoggard have had uh, very public. Uh, encounters with their governors uh they've been that both have made national news of what's going on there so i'm going to ask uh speaker hoggard to go first uh, and tell us what measures your governor has taken that seem to be extreme or in your view is an overreach in responding to the outbreak well thanks um <clears throat> there have been several executive orders issued and those most of those are fine the uh executive orders addressed uh extensions of time to renew CDLs and other licensing requirements and that sort of thing. So that was all appropriate and uh, we're glad for that, that we could see that happen. Uh, there were also other executive orders that uh, addressed two counties in particular, the county I live in, the county my office is in, which this area constitutes about a, almost a third of the state's population. And for those, this area is where the Smithfield pork processing had the hot spot and then uh, one of our nursing homes in the city had a, a lot of positive tests and some deaths out of there so there was an executive order issued that addressed these two counties required that anyone over 65 or having a vulnerable condition pursuant to cdc descriptions that they remain in their residence and you know those that executive order which was renewed a couple of times indicated that anybody in these these two counties in those conditions over 65 or vulnerable that they would remain in their residence other than for essential uh, activities such as going to the doctor or something like that and it also indicated that uh, if you're in that category you shall wash your hands often and you shall clean and disinfect frequently used surfaces and that sort of thing so there's it was kind of a heavy handed order. There wasn't any specific implementation or sanctions associated with it, but it was still an executive order that I think had the governor read it carefully, she might not have signed it, but I don't know that she read it very carefully. So there was that, but then there was also after our regular session, we have with our veto day, which is a couple of weeks after the session. And on veto day, I think we might've been the first legislature in this in the country that uh, did the virtual meeting uh, i actually went to the capitol and conducted the meeting from the capitol and there were about a dozen people that also went there because they felt constitutionally they were compelled to do that so we conducted our session and during that session the governor also proposed some expanded uh, or some legislation to expand the authority of mayors and uh, county commissions and had we passed that it flew through the senate got to the house and we spent about four or five hours killing it and uh, had that made it through the house it would have allowed our local mayor to have significantly expanded authority and he was wanting to shut down our entire city and and that would have had a tremendous impact on on the entire state so thankfully that did not happen but those were proposals from the governor's office because i think she just didn't want to deal with it personally uh, and have to make those hard decisions. So that's what we've experienced. Okay, thank you. I know the Smithfield episode was national news, and so we were all interested as we watched that unfold. Uh, President Adams, what what is your response to uh, the governor overreach and in the outbreak? It seems like uh, when there's an emergency declaration that's been made, everybody wants an exception to their policy uh, everywhere in the state. And, uh, you know, our, our governor made 14 executive orders last year. He's over 50 this year. And uh, so it's, it's a big problem. Uh, some of them that were, that were challenging. Uh, and, and one of the things we found is that he, he didn't talk to us at all before he did them. They're just, I, sometimes I'd get a call as he was going into the, his press conference to announce his executive orders, uh, put a moratorium on evictions. I mean, we what a uh, what a challenge to to landlords and to banks. And when people are told they just don't need to pay the rent, 
uh, what a uh, that 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 caused a lot of problems, and we eventually fixed it. But uh, we had uh, signature requirements on our on our petitions and referendums, and those that were running for for governor. We had a governor's race going on. He changed those just by executive order. Changed those requirements. Uh, he uh, uh, we we set up a process where we move. Uh, you know, as uh, well, first thing he did is actually shut down a lot of the the areas within the state. But then, as we moved from red to orange to yellow to green, was our were our our different uh, areas. He'd do that uh, on his own without talking to us. It just seemed like he had total control of the, the the policy and the implementation of that policy. Mm -hmm. So that became uh, it's very problematic. And so uh, we'll talk more, I think, on the next question is what we've done, but. It, it's uh, been a real issue in Utah. Thank you, President Adams. What about, uh, I know Speaker Voss, you have had, um, uh, uh, I think you're the only one here who has a uh, governor of the opposing party. And I know you've had some, uh, actually had a lawsuit uh, arising out of that. Tell us a little bit about that. We did, you know, this is one of those times. So uh, I don't know how all of your states do it in Wisconsin. We give the governor 60 days emergency powers whenever he declares a pandemic. The legislature has the right to go in and rescind that. And if it goes beyond 60 days, the governor has to have an affirmative vote from the legislature to continue those powers. Uh, you would think knowing they have divided legislature, the governor would have found every way possible to work together to try to say we should be fighting the virus, not each other. But right away in the beginning, he began to issue executive orders without consulting in any meaningful way. Uh, my Senate counterpart or myself, uh, he did things that were clearly outside the norm for what we would want to do uh, in a society that still believes in uh, personal liberties and the, uh, the importance of the law. Uh, just like Stewart said in Utah, our governor issued a moratorium on evictions. Uh, he did all kinds of things that clearly uh, did not meet the letter of that bipartisan cooperation. Uh, we did put together a coronavirus relief package that took some of his best ideas, uh, some of the ones that he did around surrounding regulatory relief and licensing reform. We put that into a bill that allowed um, it to be passed and signed by the governor in the middle of April. Uh, but the most disappointing part is that a lot of these things did not have to be done by executive order. I think the legislature was always a willing partner, um, but we didn't have one in the executive branch because this is a clear indicator to me that when legislators in the past uh, or the federal government gave the ability for a single individual to make decisions, rarely, especially with opposing parties, did they say, let's do like President Lincoln did, where we bring together that team of rivals, where we say we're gonna fight uh, the common enemy and not each other it really in many ways kind of devolved into an argument uh, which should have never occurred. Uh, as co-equal branches of government, this would have been a prime example for us to show we can work together, um, but our governor was incredibly partisan. Uh, like I say, no consultation. You probably heard on the first meeting we had after the lawsuit was won by uh, the legislature, uh, the governor's office secretly recorded the conversations and then leaked them to the media. I mean, can you imagine a more disingenuous act to say you've just lost the lawsuit and now we're going to come together and talk about what the potential bipartisan answers are and then you record it and release it for a partisan advantage. So I think that it's just a good reminder that, um, you know, this is where you test your mettle. And I think that a lot of executives, knowing that they had the chance to bring people together, chose the opposite. And it should be disappointing for anybody who cares about a Republican form of government. Yeah, well, thank you. That That's an excellent point. And uh, I, I guess at some point, I'd be curious to know how cooperative your governors have been. I know in some states, uh, the governors really haven't cared what the legislature thinks, and they just have gone out and done their thing. And that's not confined to one party or the other. That's that's uh, even in places where, where the governors and the legislature are all on the same page. Uh, President Fan, what is your response? Well, first and foremost, I'd like to say, I think we can all agree 100% that we probably would not like to be in any governor's shoes right now, because I, I do think this was a no win for anybody. You've got, because of politics and everything else, you have half the nation demanding that we shut the entire world down and the other half saying, open it up. And there's a few somewhere in between that. So first and foremost, um, I will tip my hat to all governors for those having to deal with this because 
in our positions, we are getting a little bit of that. Um, in Arizona, we started out okay, just like other states, but in doing the research, uh, Speaker Gunn, since we decided to do this panel, I've gone online and done a lot of research, what's going on in other states. And besides the political factor, because it is an election year, something else that I found was a very, very common thread amongst all of the states that are pushing back on their governors, regardless of who the governors are, is a lack of communications. And we've already heard a little, a little bit of that from a couple of our panelists. It seems that, first of all, I think when we go into emergency, we think it's gonna be 30 or 60 days at the most. Nobody ever foresaw that in a declaration of emergency and executive orders would go on for four, six months or longer. So that is showing its threads there of where people are saying enough is enough. But more importantly, the bigger picture is, as we are seeing, is that if there was more communication, if there was a little more where, where the legislators were included in the process, it may not be practical to go in and actually do full on committees and, and everything like going back to business. But at the very least, they need to be part of the process. They need to be informed. Um, I think we want our governors to reach out to us and say, what do you think? I wanna hear what your constituents are saying. So in the big picture, I just wanna throw that out for not just Arizona, but everybody else. That seems to be the number one problem right now with the overreach is the lack of, of all of us being included in the process. Well, I think that's an excellent point. And, and um, I, I will make one comment here. I've talked to one of my colleagues, one of the speakers from uh, one of the other Southern states who indicated that he and the Lieutenant Governor and the governor had a conference call or a meeting every morning at 1030. Where are we? What's going on since yesterday? What do we need to do? And the governor, pulled both of them in and, and sought their counsel, sought their advice. I thought that was very wise and good leadership for that governor. On the other hand, I've talked to some others who uh, have not heard from their governor at all. And it's not because they're of the opposing party. This is not a, a, a places where there's just a Democrat governor and a Republican legislature. It is uh, it's just a matter of leadership. And that's, that's uh, that seems to be the difference to your point there, President Fan. I think it's excellent for the governors to pull in. If, if I was a governor, I think that would be wise. Help share the load, help, help seek some advice uh, from our legislative leaders and put forward a more cohesive front. But some governors just choose to go it alone. And, um, and I think you make an excellent point that in some of those states where there are the most problems, that seems to be what's happening. Um, I will, I will go then to the next, uh, to qu next question. I'll start with Stuart Adams here. Um, what, is, what should be the legislature's response when the governor exceeds his or her authority? What, what does the legislature do maybe to rein in executive overreach? So let me tell you what we, we've done, and it actually started in 2018. Uh, many uh, legislatures have the ability to call themselves into special session. We didn't have that before 2018. So we actually passed a, a constitutional amendment that gave us the ability to call us into special session ourselves uh, during a, an emergency, well, a lot of different criteria, but one of them was during an um, emergency declaration. So we did that. And uh, when we came into special session, we did exactly what uh, President Fan talked about. We actually required the governor to give us 24 hours notice legislatively uh, before he declares uh, any executive order in an emergency. And, and then we put an exception in there if there's a life threatening or, or, or a situation which he doesn't have 24 hours to, to do, uh, to give us notice on, uh, he can come back and explain it 24 hours later. But we wanted that notice, we wanted that interaction. And so we actually did that legislatively. We also put together a commission and as I talked about, he was uh, making decisions on his own. We actually put together not a legislative commission, but a commission that, that had legislators, public health people, uh, and uh, business people on it, looking at both the, the health, the, the economy, and the policy, and uh, made it a, 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 a commission that would actually make recommendations to the governor. And we gave him, as we did that, we actually then 
decided that we had lots of different municipalities and counties around the state that were just doing lots of different things. And we, we actually, by statute, uh, gave the governor power to be, to, to be able to override those, those uh, local ordinances or orders. So we had some degree of consistency, but then we did give him the power to, to actually uh, uh, make different designations or make different, different decisions for different areas of the state. So there was some flexibility to it. But the, the key in my mind was that commission that actually uh, 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 I put in place the, 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 the process of the recommendation process. And on that commission, we staffed it with both legislative staffers and executive branch staffers to, to build that continuity. And then again, required that 24 hour notice. So, so that's what we did. Well, that, that's an excellent idea. Uh, Speaker Voss, we'll go to you next. Well, we unfortunately um, had to go to the courts uh, to be able to resolve the differences. So uh, lucky for us, uh, we had a special session uh, that concluded right before our new governor was sworn in, where uh, we had a thorough discussion of what powers the executive branch had, and actually took many of the powers back that had been granted to the uh, executive branch over time uh, through, I would say, mistakes by prior legislators. Uh, so we knew that a lot of those things would require the opportunity for us to work together, um, but the governor used that as a reason to not work together, which was the most frustrating. Uh, so the only answer uh, is to have to go to court. Now, uh, we had one challenge that if we ever have the chance to fix it, I would like to go back and look at it, that for all the federal dollars that came in, um, our state statutes do not require any legislative oversight of federal dollars. So we got over $2 billion in federal funding from the federal government entirely at the discretion of the governor, 100%. We had nothing to say about it. I got to word it out like candy. And I think that's part of the challenge that we see is decisions that have been made in the past and going forward, how do we address those and how do we work on fixing them? So uh, we're having a thorough review, but having unfortunately such partisanship in the world that we live in today, the chances of finding common ground when it appears that you're um, just talking about two branches that should have more equal powers, but it becomes Republicans versus Democrats is just more challenging. So the courts decided on our circumstances um, that the governor does not get to act like a king or a czar. Uh, that was a good thing, that he still has to go through the regular process, that we have a rules committee. If you want to promulgate rules, we have the right to review, you have the right to propose. That's the way that I think our uh, framers intended this discussion to be. I am certain that when they put the statutes in for the pandemic in our state, they never in a million years assumed that the governor would not communicate with the legislative leadership. I think that was presumed again, now look back in error. So I would love to require that the governor has to consult on a regular basis. I have heard um, in many states around the country where they have had good consultation. I know I was on a call uh, not too long ago in Massachusetts, Republican governor, super majorities in the Democrat legislature, and they on a very regular basis, I think it was twice a week met and they rotated between the three offices so that they would always be on the same page and not make it look like we were having petty squabbles on things the average person just doesn't care about. Uh, so we still have a chance to do that, but it requires three to tango, right? Both branches of the legislature and the governor to agree to do that. So uh, sometimes you don't think of those things. So I would want to have a requirement that there's regular consultation. And I think that we also need to ensure that executive orders are done in a short term basis uh, and they are not going to stay forever because many of the executive orders, uh, there really is not necessarily a specific end in date. And I think, again, that that should never be where a czar gets to issue an order and people are required to follow it uh, with no opportunity for any kind of legislative review or even input, frankly. Well, thank you. I think those are some excellent points. I will tell you that uh, in my situation, we seem to have a governor who continues to push the envelope, to, continues to try to exceed the bounds of, of, of authority and wants to uh, go as far as is we will allow him to go. And sometimes we have to rein that in, and you know, make sure he stays in his lane. Uh, but that seems to be a problem in many governorships around the country. Uh, well, I think that's one of the, Philip, I think that's one of the things that, you know, as legislative leaders, we face a very big challenge because 
the public wants in a 24-hour news cycle, they want an answer right away. They want certainty. And the legislative process takes time to build consensus. So uh, many times people feel like we're trying to throw, you know, a monkey wrench into the works when the reality is it's supposed to be deliberate and you're supposed to have that required conversation so you get a generalized consensus. So, you know, when we have to, to go to court or you have to make the point that the governor is exerting their authority too vigorously, I think a lot of citizens, you know, they haven't watched, uh, you know, uh, Schoolhouse Rock. They kind of forget that you're supposed yeah. to have this interaction. Uh, and I think that's a big challenge that we also need to do a better job in the future so that people remember that we're supposed to be co-equal, not subservient. Sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, I've kind of lost my place. Uh, President Fan, have you weighed in on this question yet? No, I haven't, Speaker. Thank you so much. So in Arizona, we have, uh, the, as a legislative body, we have the ability to call ourselves in with a two-thirds of the entire um, 90 members. Or the governor has the ability to call us in for a special, special session. One of the major differences in those is the governor, if he calls us in, it has to be very specific and narrow in scope. So um, we're going to call you back in so we can discuss updating the budget or something specific. Legislators, we do not call ourselves in for anything uh, specific per se. So as a matter of fact, we have one of our house members right now that is circulating a petition trying to get enough people to sign on to call ourselves back in. Uh, to date, yesterday was the deadline. There was only 23 out of 90 that signed on. And one of the key issues of why we didn't is because uh, you know, we've all heard about runaway conventions. Well, this could definitely be a runaway session, especially when our primaries are only three weeks away. And so consequently, even if we could bring ourselves in safely, what is it exactly we would do? Would we be able to have committee hearings go to the floor? We can't even agree whether to wear masks or not right now. So um, <laughs> the thought of us actually getting 60 people on the floor in the House and 30 in the Senate to actually have a serious conversation without it breaking down into um, anything and everything because right now they're pushing for things like raising the unemployment, police reform, defunding the cops. I mean, anything and everything would be out there. So at least for the next three weeks, calling us back into special session is not a good idea for either part. Um, I, you know, I think that everything that we are hearing and seeing from all the other states. Uh, and this is something I said like two months ago, after the primaries, I'm going to start forming some task force so that we can start getting a handle on what did Arizona and all the other states do well? And what did we not do really well? Were we prepared to handle 100,000 unemployment cases in a week? Were we prepared this, but more importantly, one of those commissions is going to be exactly this. We need to go back and say, you know what, if there's going to be emergency more than 30 or 60 days, we need to start implementing a lot of these things that everybody here has been suggesting because we're, we're thinking the same thing as well. Yeah, that's, those are excellent ideas. Speaker Hoggard, how, how about you? I would say the, the historically the, the problem that uh, we face with the the emergency powers is that that emergency power is really contemplating the uh, nuclear annihilation that we feared back in the uh, Cold War era. And so when you look at those statutes and the constitutional provisions, a lot of that was adjusted in like 1959, 1960. And so they were thinking about a nuclear attack. They weren't thinking about a pandemic. And there, there are some uh, suggestions along the lines of epidemics and that sort of thing but it wasn't contemplating this kind of a situation where the economy is shut down along with uh, the healthcare concerns. So, you know, I, I really appreciate the comments that have been made and, and what's been uh, done in Utah. I think we'll take a look at that and, and see if we can implement something along that line. And unfortunately, some of this ends up being contentious, even at this point, probably trying to take anything away from the executive branch but especially difficult when you try to propose any kind of a constitutional amendment. And uh, part of what I heard too is just the ongoing problem in all of our states that the legislature doesn't really have a me uh, messaging mechanism. And we, it, it, takes, it takes way too long to get 
even the, the legislative leadership on the same page, much less trying to get some sort of a consensus about what the message should be coming out of the legislative body. So that's just an inherent problem. And I guess that's something we've got to figure out how to deal with and get ourselves back into a position where we are a, an equal branch of government. But, you know, this, these generations since World War II have really ceded a lot of authority to executive branches, uh, both at the state and federal levels. And so sadly, we end up in a situation that I think George Washington feared. He didn't want to become the, the king of the United States or king of the, the nation. He wanted to make sure that there was this Republican form of government and a constitutional mm. republic. And, and unfortunately, we don't have much of that when a crisis arises. And so all of a sudden, without even reliable data, we ceded all this authority off to the executive branch, both at the federal level and the state levels. And we need to revisit that. I think that maybe that's been the real blessing that can come out of this, this virus situation is now we have a real life example of how we need to consider new legislation, whether it's statutory or constitutional, and how we, how we make those changes so we don't end up in a situation like this again. Um, and then to plan for this possibility, because it's highly likely that this might be the new warfare. I don't know if China intended this, but you know, it's possible. And in fact, we were, my wife and I were in China just a couple of weeks before the pandemic was becoming newsworthy. And, and <clears throat> you realize the incredible control in a communist country. It's just, it's awful. And we can get there pretty quickly if we're not vigilant to that possibility. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to try to deviate here a little bit from our script. I had given all of our panelists the, the, the questions ahead of time, but I'm going to ask one that I, I didn't give them, but it's one that has surfaced. Uh, Speaker Harvard and I have spoken at least twice uh, before today, and he brought it up twice during this conversation about data, reliable data, or the lack of reliable data. Uh, I don't want this to be a session where we just beat up on governors. Uh, I kind of like uh, Karen Fan. I would not want to be in their shoes right now. They are dealing with an unknown. There is no playbook for what we're having to deal with. There's a lot of uncertainty out there. And I think many of them tried to do the best that they could in the beginning. But um, there have been and are seen, do, do seem to be some executive orders and decisions that are made that uh, – just, just may not be based upon any reliable data at this point. It's just gut feeling or it's whatever's political. Uh, so my, I guess my question is, do, do, do y'all feel like uh, the governors may or may not be operating with enough reliable data to base the decisions uh, that they're making? Uh, or do you think, uh, do you think they, they're doing the best they can? Uh, Speaker Voss, I'll go to you. I hope that question's understandable. Sure. And I would say in many ways, trying to figure out the balance between uh, new data that's coming regularly, because if you remember, they weren't sure if the virus was transmitted on cardboard boxes. Well, now we know it's not. It seems like people who are asymptomatic are much less likely to transfer than we thought before. So there's new science, so you have to give them some flexibility. Um, but at least in our situation, it seems like many times they attempt to use whatever data they have to weaponize for their own political benefit. So in our state, our governor tried to cancel an election because they were worried that their candidate might lose. In the end, we had the election, their candidate won. That's democracy, that's just what we have to have happen. Um, but that's the real fine balance you know, because as we were joking before we got on the call, nobody here is a professional epidemiologist. We just have to listen to the experts that we know and trust. And I think that when we see what's happening in this situation, I agree with you, governors have a really hard job, but the one thing that makes their job easier is having their elected officials standing by their side when they're making the decisions so that they are made in as least partisan way as they can. Uh, I just don't see a lot of that. So that's one piece of advice if any governors are watching this, having a conversation with your legislative leaders should be something you do all the time anyways. It should be a, a foreign concept. And especially when you want to build confidence in the public to know that the decisions that they are making are broadly supported and hopefully based on science and data, having more eyes look at the data to have smart people in a room from both sides 
uh, I think would add to their ability to convince the public of the decision to wear a mask or socially distance or close a business or open a business or hopefully open schools safely. So I think all those things would benefit from having more conversations, but that seems to me that uh, the only times that's really done is when the data doesn't necessarily point the direction that they want to go and they want to shuffle it up on somebody else. Thank you. Thank you. Those are excellent points. Uh, as President Fan, I'll, I'll turn to you next. Do you think we ought to demand our governors base their decisions more on reliable data? Uh, I, you know, demand is a harsh word speaker for the mere fact is do we even have reliable data, right? It's, uh, it's, it, Every day, it does change. I mean, it changed from the day we first started, and it's still changing daily as we go along. We uh, we actually have a really, really great governor. I respect and admire him. Um, he is an extremely pro-business governor, so he is trying his best to keep the, the economy going, trying to keep a balance while still having to deal with what inter other information we have. So. And it's not just state, it's national. We are getting different messages. Wear masks, don't wear masks, touch a box, don't touch a box. It's just been crazy, the lack of information. So if a governor doesn't look like they are really strong leading at any given time, it's because they're trying to figure out which direction they're supposed to go based on whatever information was given to them that day. And quite honestly, I think the only real data that they are able to actually make decisions on is the number of cases and deaths. That's, and that's assuming everybody is reporting them correctly um, the way they should be. But under that assumption, if they're being reported, then they can say, well, uh, I've made this decision and the cases went up. So I guess that was a bad decision. I guess I better roll it back or vice versa. We're okay, we're flattening. We're going to open up a little more. That's about the only real data that I think we can actually stand on right now. Thank you. Uh, Speaker Hoggart, what is your response? You know, even to today, it's just terrible data for the most part. I just, uh, some many weeks ago, I contacted our Department of Health Secretary and asked her about the ventilator issue. And early on, that was the big deal. We're going to mobilize the factories. And the president did that and got these ventilators developed. Then they found out apparently ventilators are the wrong yeah. thing to use. And so when I checked with our Department of Health, ventilators had only been used in less than 3% of the situations. And so we didn't need ventilators. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, President Fan there made some good comments in regard to uh, uh, what the governor should do, and also uh, what Speaker Voss mentioned, as far as communication with the legislative body and the public generally, I would have encouraged our governor probably to have been a lot more forthcoming with information as far as the new data coming in and caveats that might have gone out early on to saying, we're doing this, but it's only because of this data. And as new data comes in, we'll modify our positions a little bit, but I think the public would have appreciated more information rather than uh, just taking kind of a hard line on on shut down or not shut down. Yeah. So I think more communication is better in these situations, and there's there's nothing wrong with saying we're doing A, B, and C because of the data we've got. But if it changes, we're going to modify that accordingly. Mm -hmm. I think the public would have appreciated probably more. Uh, consistent uh, information as the the numbers started to come in but as you look across the country the data is I can't believe the numbers out of New York New Jersey I just don't think those were uh, based on actual cases and then as uh, has been mentioned <clears throat> you compare yeah. this this time frame to last year's time frame and the this is a different virus, but it's having a similar impact as it has in 2017, for example, when it was pretty virulent. Yeah, uh, those are some excellent points. President Adams? I think that question strikes right to the heart of this panel is when you get the data, whether you have good data or not, you've got to do something with it to make a decision. And, and uh, I, I've come up with some great ideas, I think, but as great of my, as my ideas are, they always get 
better when they're vetted by, in Utah, we have 104 legislators mm -hmm. by 103 other legislators. And the reason it is, is because they have boots on the ground. They're, they're in the community. We have a part-time legislature. They're running businesses. They're teaching schools. They're involved with, with, with dentists and doctors and with the entire community. And when you, when your data again is, is, it's difficult to get, but you get better, you get better decision-making process with what limited data you have when you share. And I think that strikes right at the heart of what we're saying here is an executive order is made by one person's decision. And when you involve others, you get a better decision-making process. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's exactly right. <clears throat> Okay, given the amount of time we have left, this is going to be our last question. I am going to try to be a little bit like the devil's advocate here. Um, what do you what do you say to people who defend their governors, defend executive overreach by claiming that this is a, a unique situation? It's unlike anything we've ever seen before. There's no playbook for how to handle this. The public health is at stake. Therefore, we got to we got to give governors a little more leeway. We got to give them a little, little more flexibility to do what they have to do to protect the public. Uh, what, what is your response to the people who try to defend the governors and, and their actions? President Fan, we'll start with you. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. Um, actually, I am one of those people for the most part. As I said, we have a good governor. Um, he is trying to walk that line very carefully, and sometimes we may fall off that line. Um, but I think as we, again, once again, as we've all said a hundred times during this deal, I think if there was more communication and the legislators were more involved with the process, it would be a lot easier for him to be able to walk that line. Um, so um, if I have any criticism at all, that would be it. Um, outside of that, I. I stand ready to help any way we possibly can to get us all through this. And I'm sure we all feel the same way about our legislative bodies as well. Thank you, Karen. Speaker Hogart, I'll go to you next. Well, I appreciate uh, the comments been made. Uh, likewise, you know, I, I think the governors have all done what they could given the circumstances. Mm -hmm. But like I said before, I think most of the, uh, the emergency powers were really intended for national devastating emergencies. Uh, and this one gives us an opportunity to reflect on that and figure out how do we make some modifications. And as I said, sounds like Utah probably has crafted something that we should probably all take a look at and consider commissions or something like that. And so the, uh, the executive power, I think, does need to be reined in. I, don't, I wouldn't think any governor would really want to be the one that takes the complete fall for some poor choice that they might have made. And so then you draw the legislature into the equation, certainly then the either the success or failure can be spread out to everyone. And I, I think we'd all do well to revisit that in light of this pandemic situation. Very good. President Adams, how about you? Well, again, I think it comes down to process and to, in response to that question, uh, the founding fathers got it right. Uh, they put together the process, and the process is the legislature passes the laws, and the executive branch or the governor executes those laws. And we need to find ways to make that process work, even in an emergency process, rather than exceptions to not make it work. And we need to follow that process. And, and again, as I mentioned earlier, I think we make better decisions when we have more eyes, more input, and more data. And I think that would be my response. Very good, thank you. Speaker Voss? You know, such great comments from my fellow panelists, but I do wanna echo what uh, Speaker Howard said. You know, when the emergency declarations are out there, I think most of us assumed that it would be for a week, 10 days, as you try to assess the situation and use all the emergency powers. I don't think it was presumed that you would have people acting unilaterally for months at a time. So I think that's something we really have to think through, that the goal of giving a, an executive the ability to act quickly is one I think we unanimously agree with because decisions have to be made. But now with technology, where you can have a Zoom call in a matter of minutes, you can talk on the phone on a regular basis, 
it's not necessarily like it had been when many of these statues went in place where you had to all convene at the Capitol mm -hmm. and it wasn't easy to do so. So you had to have one person making these decisions. So I think technology is our friend. It certainly should enable more people to be involved in decision-making as we want in the legislature. But I also think that if this is gonna be somewhat the new norm until an effective vaccine is developed, and that could be a month away or it could be a year away, the idea is you certainly can't have a king continuing to make decisions without the legislature's involvement. So I, I hope we use this as a learning example. I think one of the other panelists said that, that this should be something where we look forward and say, if this is gonna continue, how do we make it better? Or if it happens again, 100 years from now, what could we learn that they would wish we fixed when we were in the middle of it, as opposed to waiting until it occurs again, where it's too late to fix it? Yeah, I think all those answers, Br'er, a lot of wisdom and bring a lot of, of uh, insight into this situation. This is a unique situation. It's very difficult to, to navigate. This is not like a tornado or a, a natural disaster that occurs immediately. You've got to respond immediately with food and clothes and shelter. Uh, this is something that's been going on for quite some time and is going to continue to go on for some time. I think Stuart made a good point about our founding fathers creating the system of government that we have for a reason. And there are different roles that are played by the legislature and the governor, and each of them need to stay in their lane and do the job that the Constitution uh, orders them to do. And this situation is unlike anything any of us have ever seen. So we're all trying to figure out exactly what the role is. And uh, I think uh, Stuart uh, pointed out as well that he's part-time legislator. In many places, the legislature is not in session right now. And so uh, is it permissible to let the governor just run the state or should we force him to call a special session and get the legislature back down there to do their job? Those are questions that are unique from state to state. and. Uh, I think each of us are going to have to just use our best judgment as we move forward on how to handle those. I think we're out of time, but I want to thank my panelists today. I think each of you can see why I invited this group of panelists to join me. They are all tremendous leaders. They all have uh, great experience, great wisdom. Uh, I do count them as dear friends, and I thank them for being willing to give an hour of their time today to come and, and discuss this very difficult issue. Um, I know that <clears throat> there are other workshops that are taking place. I would encourage all of you to participate in those. And I know our plenary session begins in the morning with uh, kind of the kickoff for the next couple of days. So I would encourage all of our, our listeners uh, to check the agenda. There's an ALEC app that you can use. I'm using it. It's a great tool to, to identify what's going on. And you can watch all of these things from the convenience of your, your living room or your office. So again, I want to thank all my panelists for being here today. Thank all of you for participating. Hope it's beneficial to you.